Can I have, can I have your attention, please? Just for like 30 seconds. I know many of you are uh, interested in business. Um, I'd like to make a plug for the Business Leadership Conference. It's, uh, it's a program that takes place during freshman week. You take classes with HBS professors. Uh, you get to meet top recruiters from banks, hedge funds, consulting companies. You get free dinners at the Charles Hotel. Um, it's run by HSA, the HSA Center for Enterprise. We take about 100 applicants every year. I would encourage all of you to apply, especially if you're interested in business school or if you're a junior gearing up for recruiting season. You get to make these contacts uh, before recruiting season starts. Uh, BLP is great exposure. The deadline is this Sunday, May 7th, and you can get more information at the HSA website, www.hsa.net. Just go to the Center for Enterprise, and the application will be up online. Thanks. So this is our last class, and we have a lot to get through, so I'm going to begin, begin with the end. Before I go into the summary mode, which, which I want to do, because I think it is important to just try and put together um, some of the ideas that we discussed in class, I want to finish the, uh, the last lecture that I started uh, last Monday about dirty hands. And remember the question that I asked and that Sartre essentially asked and that Professor Badaraco asked, is it possible to lead, to govern innocently? Is it possible to lead without getting your hands dirty? And my answer to that was that it wasn't possible. That to be a leader requires getting our hands dirty why? Because to be a leader requires very often to choose between right and right. And the question then is, how do we make these choices? How do we make the choice, for instance, between laying off someone who's not pulling his weight in the organization or and thereby hurting the person um, or, or keeping that person on? How do we make these difficult decisions? We talked about Robert Haas from Levi's, who didn't want to fire people, who wanted to keep local manufacturing going on. And the price that he and the organization eventually paid was 16,000 layoffs and 29 plants closed. These are tough decisions to make, or the decisions that political leaders have to make. How do you define life? Do you go to war? These are right, always, right versus right decisions. And how do you make these decisions? And we started talking about it, and the first thing we talked about was that you need to cl clarify your hierarchy of values. What are the most important things for you? So it's a no-brainer that you would lie to someone who asked you, you know, where are the children that you're, that you're babysitting? That's a no-brainer. That's an easy right versus right. Yeah, of course it's right. Um, to save lives, and it's higher on the hierarchy than being honest. But there are dis decisions that are so difficult, and only if you clarify your hierarchy of values can you make the more right decision out of the two or three options or more. And for that, we need to take time to reflect. Remember what Nelson Mandela said in the, um, um, in the uh, interview with Oprah? You know, she made fun of him saying, did you need 27 years to reflect? But what he said was that leaders need it because leadership development is personal development. They're one and the same. And in order to personally develop, in order to clarify what am I about as a leader, why am I doing it in the first place, we need to take time aside. One of the interventions that I introduce into organizations, one of the first interventions and has been the most successful over the years, is I take the leaders away with no particular agenda. We go and we just hang out for a weekend. Because while leaders don't have time today, or the busy, often the busiest in the organization, they're the ones who need the most time off. 
It works the opposite of the way it's supposed to work. Leaders are supposed to have much more time to reflect and sit down. Instead, they're running around, usually more than anyone else. So by taking the leaders out of the organization, giving them time aside, it is incredible what happens on these retreats with no agenda. The best ideas come up. The best plans come up. It is important for a leader, for you, as a current leader, future leader, to take time off. It's the mark of all great leaders. And then it's about asking questions. Right versus right decisions don't have easy answers. And it's more important to spend a lot of time clarifying these questions. In the interview that I had on Monday with Seth Klarman, one of the most successful entrepreneurs, investors in this country, hence in the world. What he talked about, how does he make difficult ethical decisions? He asks questions like, what would it be like if it appeared in the Wall Street Journal tomorrow? What would my children think about it if they knew it? These are some of the questions that he asked. What would my role model, model do it? He talked about Martin Luther King. What would he have done in this situation? You know, as a teacher, my role model is Marvel Collins. I asked, what would Marvel Collins have done in this situation? Let me read you an excerpt from a Boston Globe op-ed, which really caught my attention. Um, it's by Jeff Jacoby, who is a columnist. He writes every week. And he wrote uh, an op-ed uh, during the Terry Schiavo um, debate throughout the country. Should she be kept alive or not? And he wrote an op-ed which he, which he uh, titled Praying for Certainty. Here are just excerpts from it. Unlike many of those weighing in on the Terry Schiavo matter, I'm having trouble working myself into a ladder of outraged certainty. Is Michael Schiavo's profoundly disabled wife in a persistent vegetative state, as so many insist? Or is she, as others claim, at least dimly aware of her circumstances? Is her condition quite irreversible? Or might she yet regain consciousness, as Sarah Scantlin of Hutchinson, Kansas, did last month after 20 years in a coma. I couldn't say for sure. How is it that so many others can? Even as hypotheticals, these are tough to wrestle with. Do you want your loved ones to keep you alive once your personality and intellect are gone? Would you ever want them to withhold medical care even if you weren't in pain and your condition weren't terminal? Is the sanctity of life your highest priority? Should financial cost be an issue? Some answers are clear, others anything but. A decision has to be made about Terry Schiavo, and my head and my heart are with those who, could, who would err on the side of life. But don't count me among the dogmatists. This is one case that calls for less certainty and more prayer. The reason why I like, you know, whether you agree with his politics, if, if you read him or not, the reason why I like this op-ed is because what he's doing, basically the entire op-ed is questions. This is a right versus right decision. Do you keep someone alive? What if they come to, what if they wake up the day after you would have allowed them to die? Maybe. Who knows what is going on in the head? There is so much uncertainty there. And he asks questions after questions after questions. And this is the approach we need to take when we have right versus right decisions. Eventually, if he was the you know, the judge, and you would have had to make the decision, he would have made, made the decision. But it's realizing that it's difficult. And this applies to all difficult questions, all right versus right decisions. And along with it, we talked about the great leader being empathic, having emotional intelligence. This is the first pillar of emotional intelligence. You inevitably, as a leader, hurt others. Inevitably. Why? Because you can't please all people all of the time. If you go to war, you hurt others. If you don't go to war, you hurt others. If you're pro-life, you hurt others. If you're pro-choice, you also hurt others. It's inevitable. And the great leader inevit inevitably does it and recognizes that and empathizes with the other side, doesn't lose 
the side of the human element that's on the other side of his or her decision. And because these decisions are so hard, whether in politics, whether in an organization, the leader has to have beautiful enemies. It is very easy to discount the other side. For instance, there are people in the room who are pro-war on Iraq and anti-war on Iraq. It's very easy to dismiss the people who are anti-Iraq war as detached pacifists. It is very easy to dismiss those who were for the war in Iraq as hungry warmongers. Very easy. But it's important to understand the underlying reason of most people for their decision. And the underlying reason is because they want to do good. You may find it hard to believe with others, but ultimately people want to do good. There, there are people in the world who are you know, sadists and just want to hurt others. But they're the rare exception. Most people, when they make decisions, they think that they're making the right decision. It's important to listen to both sides, to seek people who disagree with you, to maintain empathy for the other side, and then to decide. And whatever you decide, you decide. You may have made a mistake, maybe not. But the process of getting to that certainty, it has to be the simplicity on the other side of complexity. Not just pure simplicity, because there are no simple answers for leaders, especially when you climb up the hierarchy. There are no easy answers. There are no simple answers which are on this side of complexity. Your hope is to get to the other side of complexity. And to do that, you need to take time. You need to ask questions. You need to empathize. And you need to seek beautiful enemies. It's the only way to get to the other side of complexity. Seth Klarman touched on this when I asked him on Monday, so how do you make these tough decisions? And he says, he looks at the broader picture. So remember he talked about f having to fire someone and how difficult it was? And how does he do it? He says, I think about the entire organization and I see the, the repercussions, the consequences of having this person in the organization and how that particular person that he ended up firing, even though he was a star performer, made a lot of money for the firm. He fired him because he was poisoning the organization. In other words, what he did was zoom out and look not just at the particular case here, he's making me $300 million a year, but zooming out and saying he's poisoning my entire organization and hurting the morale. This is what Robert Haas did not do when he refused to fire people. Why? Because he just said, I'm not going to hurt people, I'm going to keep them in Levi's. He didn't look at the bigger picture and that was a big mistake because he ended up hurting the big picture with 16,000 employees eventually fired. Looking at the big picture, also looking at the big picture in time. So both in time and in space. After 9-11, if you zoom in on the World Trade Center, on Flight 93, on the Pentagon, it is very easy to say we need to go to war and we need to go to war with all the countries that are involved in 9-11, directly or indirectly, if you just focus on this incident. I mean, who would not be outraged by it? At the same time, if you zoom in on a village in Afghanistan or Iraq that was hit by American attacks, it is very easy to say war is bad, we shouldn't be here. It depends what you zoom on. The great leader does that also, but is also able to zoom out and look at the bigger picture, both in terms of, spatially in terms of the other things going on at the same time, and also temporally, what has led to it, what will be the long-term consequences to it, whether of war or refraining from war. And these are the questions that the, the, the great leader asks. That doesn't mean that the leader won't make mistakes. We cannot, unfortunately, or maybe fortunately, we cannot predict the future perfectly. So a leader will inevitably make mistakes. We talked about that. However, to minimize the likelihood of mistakes, it is not good just to make an emotional decision based on one instance, but a more rational decision based on the big picture. Not easy, 
but important. And finally, it's about making the decision and recognizing that ultimately you will pay a price for it. There is an inevitable price for leadership. It's not for the faint of heart to make these difficult decisions. But if this is your truth, you need conviction. Remember, a leader, as we'll talk about when we wrap up, a leader cannot be a relativist. Well, this may be true or this may be true. A leader, when making the decision, has to have convictions and also has to recognize that there is a price for it and that there is inevitable price for it. What is the price? First of all, a price that all great leaders pay. They sometimes make mistakes. But even if they don't make mistakes, even if they choose the right, the more right of the two options, they're still hurting people. Because to fire someone is to hurt someone. To criticize someone is very often to hurt someone. To go to war or not to go to war is to hurt someone. And then sometimes, since a leader is also a human being, a leader makes mistakes choosing the wrong right out of the two. And the higher you go up in the hierarchy, the more difficult these decisions become and the more consequential they become. And finally, inevitably, there is rejection. Even if the majority like you as a leader, even if many people like you as a leader, many also don't. And that applies to all great leaders. Why? Because if everyone liked what you were doing, it wouldn't require great leadership. Because very often great leadership is about going against the grain, at least initially. And if we look at our greatest leaders, they very often paid a high price in terms of their life. You know, Gandhi, who after many years did enjoy very high popularity, still does, paid with his life. Mandela, paid with 27 years. JFK, paid with his life, even though he was, at the time, in 62 and 63, a popular president. There is inevitable rejection. I'm not saying even paying the price in terms of getting killed. I'm, I'm talking about the day-to-day -day leaders in organizations. You can't please everyone all of the time. And if you do, it means, as a leader, you're either doing something that doesn't require greatness or you're doing the wrong thing. You're a pseudo leader, maybe. Inevitably, great leaders have to make tough decisions which will upset some people. So leaders have to have a very thick skin. So the inevitable question from these inevitabilities is, why be a leader? Why even go for it? And why do many people want to be leaders? Why would one, you, me, others want to even enter this? Because I want to read you um, an excerpt from the biography of, of Lincoln, arguably the greatest president this country has seen. This is describing his life. As the months passed, a deathly weariness settled over him. Once, when Noah Brooks suggested he rest, Lincoln replied, I suppose it is good for the body, but the tired part of me is inside and out of reach. There had always been a part of him, inside and out of reach, that had looked upon his ambition with detachment and wondered if the same was worth the candle. Now he could see the truth of what he had long dimly known and perhaps hopefully suppressed, that for a man of sensitivity and compassion to exercise great powers in a time of crisis is a grim and agonizing thing. Instead of glory, he once said, he had found only, quote, ashes and blood. This was for him the end project of that success myth by which he had lived and for which he had been so persuasive a spokesman. He had had his ambitions and fulfilled them, 
and met heartache in his triumph. This is Lincoln, arguably the greatest leader this country has seen, met heartache when he actually became that leader. So why do it? Well, some people would say for the power, for the prestige. That's a reason many people go into it for it. It cannot sustain long-term success and it won't make a leader great. Ultimately, it's one thing and one thing alone that drives great leadership, that makes for a great leader. It's the desire to make a difference. Because no one, not in an organization, not in a country, not in a team, not in a group, makes as much of a difference as a leader does. It doesn't have to be the official leader. Rosa Parks was not an official leader, but she stood up and became a leader. But the important thing when deciding, and this is an important decision, when you decide to become a leader, is to recognize that it's not an easy one. You know, the last thing I want you to come out of this class thinking is, all right, I'm going to be a leader, I'm ready to be a leader, hooray. It's not easy. You pay a price for it. And it's important to take time aside to reflect, to zoom out on your life, on your characteristics, on who you are, on what you're about, on your hierarchy of values, and to ask yourself, do I want to step up? Do I want to be a leader? And then make the decisions the decision, and at the same time to realize that to be or not to be a leader is a right versus right decision. And that requires time, that requires thought, and that requires a lot of courage to be able to face your internal truth. Let's go over some of the things that we discussed throughout the semester. Try and make some loose ends meet. I mentioned at the beginning I quoted Warren Bennis, who is arguably the leading leadership researcher in the world, who said that if he had to talk about if he had to talk about leadership in a as a theory of leadership, he could talk for days. But if he had to talk about leadership development, and I quote him, he said, he could only talk for 10 to 20 minutes. Why? Because when it comes to leadership development, we're in our diapers. And I think he's right. And he's right, A, because the field has not developed a lot, and B, because leadership development ultimately comes from within. It is very difficult to teach theories about leadership development. That's why it's such an important part of this class. I know for many of you, not for all, but for many of you has been the coaching groups where you learned a lot from one another. You learned a lot about yourself through introspection, through the reflection papers. But at the same time, there is a theory of leadership that I think of leadership development that I think is forming that I try to communicate throughout the semester. So here are some of the highlights uh, from the semester. We started off by talking about how leadership development is about personal development. No difference between the two. Confucius, the ancients who wished to illustrate illustrious virtue throughout the kingdom, first ordered well their own states. Wishing to order well their states, they first regulated their families. Wishing to regulate their families, they first cultivated their persons. What he's doing here in the words of Harvard professor Tu Wei Ming, is creating concentric circles where the self is in the middle, the family, the city, and so on to the world. And like the butterfly effect, and even more so, the leader can have ripples, can, the effect can ripple to the entire world. This is what leadership is about, but it starts with the person. Warren Bennis, the process of becoming a leader is much the same as the process of becoming an integrated human being, 
For the leader, as for any integrated person, life itself is the career. And it continues for our entire lives, this process of development. It doesn't end with a, certainly doesn't end with a class. It doesn't end when you have become the CEO or the political leader. It continues always. We talked about Genusian thinking, about how important it is for a leader not to think in either or categories, but to be able to reconcile seeming opposites and generate a third way. We talked about the, um, the thesis antithesis and synthesis that Hegel speaks about. And we quoted Parker Palmer who says, paradoxical thinking requires that we embrace a view of the world in which opposites are joined so that we can see the world clearly and see it whole. The result is a world more complex and confusing than the one made simple by either or thought. But that simplicity is merely the dullness of death. When we think together, we reclaim the life force in the world, in our students, in ourselves. He's talking here about teaching. He's talking here about leading. We don't think the world apart. We think the world together. And here are some examples that we discussed. Is leadership in the person or is it in the situation? Well, both. The United States was ripe after a lot of development for a Martin Luther King. But without a Martin Luther King, what had transpired may not have transpired. So it's both the person and the situation. Should we be democratic and authoritarian? And the answer to that was contingency theory. Well, it depends. There are times, maybe when you're in the midst of battle, when you want to be authoritarian. When there is no time, you may want to be authoritarian. When you still don't know the organization or the people working with you, you may want to be authoritarian, but there is certainly time for democracy, for opening up the floor and hearing feedback and ideas. The great leader is able to navigate between these two and find it a synthesis. We talked about how a leader cannot be dogmatic. A, leader has to be, a great leader has to be open-minded, listen to other people. solicit beautiful enemies, people who will challenge him or her. At the same time, as I mentioned earlier, a leader cannot be a relativist. A leader has to have real convictions. Understand, this is what I'm about. These are my values. These are the things that I will not stand for. These are the things that I will not move. And we talked about a leader having to be tough and nice. On the one hand, it is important for a leader to have emotional intelligence, to be emp empathic, to be caring. At the same time, it's also important for a leader to make tough decisions and to be tough with others, to be a beautiful enemy to others too. Easier said than done. As you know, this is something that I worked on for, uh, this semester, to be more of a beautiful enemy. And the nice leaders in the long run, those who are only nice, do not succeed. And unfortunately, there are many examples of these fallen nice guys. At the same time, that doesn't mean we cannot be empathic and caring. We need to find the right synthesis of when to be when. Always respectful. Always respectful. At the same time, it need, we need toughness as well. Then we talked about the coaching model that you implemented to some extent in your group. The first, the first part of the coaching model is unconditional acceptance. The second is appreciative inquiry. And this is where leadership development take takes place within this, but also other things such as your relationships, parenting, personal development takes place within the space that you create through unconditional acceptance and through appreciative inquiry. Unconditional acceptance, I drew an analogy to the ground, to the soil. You need the soil to create growth for a, for a seed. Appreciative inquiry is the sunlight on top of this, on top of this soil. Without sunlight, the seed will wither and die. Here is what appreciative inquiry is about. 
Traditional approaches to problem solving are, by definition, a way of seeing the world as a class half empty. The appreciative inquiry is an alternative process to bring about organizational change by looking at the glass as half full. Essentially, appreciative inquiry varies from other approaches to organizational change in that it builds on what works well. One of the key aspects of this, of this class. Let's focus on what works well. Let's focus on the potential and appreciate it and appreciate it in the two senses of the word. Be grateful for it and also, like money appreciates, like money grows, make it grow. An appreciative inquiry is about looking at what worked in the past, using it to inspire the present and leverage it to the future. A very effective technique that works not just in the workplace, not just in leadership development, but also, as we said earlier, in relationships, in parenting, in your daily life. Very often what we focus on is what we accentuate. And we only, if we only focus on the negatives, on the weaknesses of the organization, on our weaknesses as leaders, very often that is what expands. We talked about authentic leadership and how authentic leadership comprises two parts. First of all, it's about knowing thyself knowing what you are, your strengths, your weaknesses, your hopes, your aspirations, your values, what you're willing to compromise, what you're not, and being true to oneself. Know thyself and be thyself. That is leadership on one foot. As Parker Palmer says about teaching and about leading, good teaching cannot be reduced to technique. Good teaching comes from the identity and integrity of the teacher. Identity, know thyself. Know who, know who you are. What is your identity? Integrity, be thyself. Live according to this. And this is advice not just for teachers, not just for leaders, but for healthy living. Because we also read that article about self-concept clarity, that these are people with the highest levels of self-esteem, higher levels of happiness. These are the most successful people in the long run. Or in other words, what it's about is identifying your passions, identifying your strengths, and then saying, this is where I'm going to lead. And this is the zone of great leadership. There are very few things that are common to great leaders. This is one of them. What am I good at? Because remember, we, we, in the article that we, that we talked about, it is easier to get from a 10 to a 40 than from a negative 10 to a negative 4. So if we focus on our strengths, if we, we are much more likely to accentuate them. If we appreciate them, they're much more likely to grow. And that's when we are successful, especially if we find those things that we are passionate about, that we care about deeply. We then moved and said, okay, so this is the zone of great leadership. Where do I want to apply my potential to? Where do I want to plant my seed? And that's when we talked about the vision. Warren Bennis, the first basic ingredient of leadership is a guiding vision. The leader has a clear idea of what he or she wants to do professionally and personally, leadership development and personal development, and the strength to persist in the face of setbacks, even failures. Warren Bennis wrote a book called Geeks and Geezers where he wanted to see the difference between leaders who are young, in their 30s, the geeks, and leaders who are older, in their 70s and 80s, the geezers. And he compared between the two groups, and there were many differences. One of the differences was that the younger group cared about work-life balance. The older group didn't know what he was talking about. That was one of the differences. Seth Klarman spoke about this on Monday, how important it is for him. But one commonality that he found between the two groups is that they all, all the great leaders, they all inevitably went through crucibles. They went through crucibles, through difficult experiences that had shaped them, that had formed them. It could be something like losing a loved one. 
that made them think about their life and the value of their lives. It could be about failing in business, going bankrupt. And it was through that failure, through that crucible, that they were able to emerge even stronger. As Nietzsche said, if it doesn't kill me, it makes me stronger. Well, they be emerged much stronger from these crucibles. Especially if you put yourself on the line. You will face setbacks. You will face failures. It's inevitable. What differentiates great leaders from the not so great is are you able to get up after this failure? Those who do ultimately emerge as the people who make the most difference. Not easy, but that's what it takes. Because if it was easy, everyone would have been a leader and then we wouldn't really need leaders. The most important with a vision is to follow up with action. Noel Tishy from University of Michigan, unless a vision is sustained by action, it quickly turns to ashes. Ralph Waldo Emerson, what you do speaks so loudly that I cannot hear what you say. Remember the experiment that we did here with the cheek and the chin? You do what leaders do rather than what they say. If you tell your organization all day long, be honest, be ethical. It's important. This is what I demand from you. And yet you as a leader bend the rules and, are, and is and unethical. Your organization will not be an ethical one. They will do what you do rather than what you say. Same with parenting, by the way. Lead by example. Or as Gandhi said, be the change you want to see in the world. Your organization, the people will look up to you. They will embody your moods and your values to a great extent. Moods and values are contagious, especially when it comes to a leader. And then we moved on to, once you have a vision, how do you create a healthy process, a healthy environment? And the model that we saw was that the leader's assumptions and expectations, theory X, theory Y, lead to the leader's behavior that create an organizational environment and bring about the behavior in employees that the leader expected in the first place. And then it reinforces these expectations again. It's a self-fulfilling prophecy. It's possible to change by the follower's behavior. Rosa Parks, as a follower, changed what the leaders thought over time. But that is rare. And it's usually the leader who is able to, to create an environment that's conducive to bring out the best in people. And you did this exercise yourselves. And most of you found that the same person, bless you, the same person behaved radically different under leader of theory X versus leader of theory Y. Why? Because leaders often get what they expect. We then talked about the meta-analysis, and this is what Scott Snook talked about a lot, and we reinforced throughout the semester. The Pygmalion effect. In other words, what do you expect? The largest developmental impact was raising the positive beliefs of followers, instilling in them the conviction that they were better at performance tasks than they thought. This is also the role of a parent. This is also the role of a romantic partner or a friend. The most successful relationships in the long run are ones where you expect more from your partner than the partner expects from him or herself and vice versa. Why? It's not that we're being unrealistic. It's not that it's an illusion. It is real. The difference is that we see the potential. So if you see the potential of an oak tree in a seed, it's not an illusion, even though it's not there right now. The same with leadership qualities. The same with excellence. And Seth talked a lot on Monday about excellence. If you see excellence in people, even if it's not realized yet, but you say, this is a seed, I'm going to appreciate it, shed light on it, and make it grow, great things will happen the number one predictor of leadership development and also of personal development. What do you expect from yourself? What do you appreciate? What are your strengths? Look at them, shed light on them, because if we don't, they very often wither and die, like a seed would. And then last time, or last week, we talked about 
Joe Badaracco's work on choosing between right and right, where he said, the inspirational approach to ethics offers little help with serious conflicts of responsibility. What to do when one clear right thing must be left undone in order to do another, or when doing the right thing requires doing something wrong. These are the difficult decisions, and you need to take time aside. I would like to take a few minutes now to appreciate some people that made this class possible. First of all, I would like to thank the people behind the scenes who made the scenes possible. First, I'd like to acknowledge Barry Reed, who have gone way beyond the Call of Duty, was always there, sitting there with the audiovisual. Thank you very much, Barry, for taking the leadership role. I would like to thank the person who made it possible, for those of you who are not in class today, to watch the class. Um, Alex O'Connor, thank you very much for being here every time. And I'd like to ask the TFs in this class to come up to the stage now, please. And I'd like us to take a minute to thank these wonderful leaders for making this class possible, because without them, it would have been a seminar and probably not a very good one. So thank you very much to you. with a question that I asked at the beginning. John Gardner, where are the Jeffersons and Lincolns of today? The answer, I'm convinced, is that they are among us. Out there in the settings with which we're all familiar are the unawakened leaders, feeling no overpowering call to lead and hardly aware of the potential within. I hope that after this class, you are aware more, more aware of the potential that's within because these are the times just like they were in the 18th centuries, in which a genius would wish to live. Great necessities call forth great leaders. And I will end where I started. These are time, times where great leaders are necessary, and they're here, they're among us. This class, as you know, is dedicated to Professor Phil Stone, my mentor, my leader, the person who as a teacher and as a leader had the most significant impact on my life and my decision to do what I'm doing. His spirit was in the class throughout, his teachings were throughout. And I was reminded when I was thinking about this last lecture that he told me about the time when he came to Harvard, late 50s, early 60s, and he told me about the energy that was in the air in the social sciences, psychology, economics, government, philosophy also, where the scholars in these areas believed that they could change the world. And there was so much power, so much inspiration, so much energy at that time that they really believed that it was going to happen, that he himself believed that he was going to happen. And then he said he thinks some of this energy has been lost over the years. For psychologists, philosophers, e economists, politicians, young people no longer have the same kind of inspiration that there was in the 60s. And as I was thinking about that, I said to myself, I wish, Phil, you were here, and I hope you're watching. 
Because all he needed to do, and I hope he's doing that, because he has the password, is reading your response papers. I hope that he looks into your eyes when you talk about leadership, whether it's in office hours, whether it's in your sections. I hope he's watching and listening as you talk in the dining halls, whether during faculty dinners or just by yourselves or with your friends, talking about the difference you want to make in the world. I hope Phil is watching. In fact, I know he's watching. And he's watching, and he's proud, and he's inspired, as I am. So thank you.